The cave to which Sri Bhagavan went first and in which he stayed longest is on the southeast slope. It is called Virupaksha, after a saint who dwelt and was buried there, probably in the 13th century. It is curiously shaped to resemble the sacred monosyllable, Om, the tomb being in the inner recess, and it is said that the very sound Om can be heard within. The trustees of the Virupaksha Math, the shrine in town, had also property rights over the cave and used to levy a small fee on pilgrims who visited it at the annual festival of Kartikai. At the time when Sri Bhagavan went there, this practice had fallen into abeyance because two parties were disputing the ownership and a lawsuit was pending between them. When the case was decided, the successful party resumed the levy, but by that time the stream of visitors had grown much larger and was continuous throughout the year, not merely at the time of the Kartikai. And since it was the presence of Sri Bhagavan that drew them there, the fee had become, in effect, a tax on access to him. In order not to sanction this, he moved out of the cave to a level patch of ground in front of it and sat under the shade of a tree there. The ancient thereupon shifted his place of collection to the outer perimeter to include access to the tree also. So Sri Bhagavan left and went to the Sadguru Swami cave lower down, and then, after a short stay there, to another cave. The stream of visitors to Virupaksha cave ceased, and the proprietors, finding that they had only in inconvenienced the Swami without benefiting themselves, asked him to return and undertook not to levy the fee so long as he occupied the cave. On this condition he returned. In the summer months, Virupaksha cave becomes oppressively hot. There is a cave near the Mulepal Tirtha tank at the foot of the hill that is cooler and has a supply of pure water for drinking. A mango tree stands over it, giving shade from which it has acquired the name of Mango Cave. Two brothers, devotees of Sri Bhagavan, blasted away the overhanging rock and put up a front wall with a door and he occupied it during the hot months. In the year 1900, shortly after Sri Bhagavan went to live on the hill, a devotee named Nala Pillai from Kumbakonam came to Tiruvannamalai and took a photograph of him, the earliest portrait we have. It is the face of a beautiful youth, almost a child, yet with the strength and profundity of Bhagavan the Lord. During the early years on the hill, Sri Bhagavan still maintained silence. His radiance had already drawn a group of devotees around him, and an ashram had come into being. It was not only seekers after truth that were drawn to him, but simple people, children, and even animals. Young children from the town would climb the hill to Virupaksha cave, sit near him, play around him, and go back feeling happy. Squirrels and monkeys would come up to him and eat out of his hand. He occasionally wrote out explanations or instructions for his disciples, but his not speaking did not really impede their training, because now and later, when he had resumed speech, his real teaching was through silence, in the tradition of Dakshinamurthy. The tradition exemplified also in China by Lao Tzu and the early Taoist sages. As they state, that Tao which can be named is not the Tao, which is to say the knowledge which can be formulated is not the true knowledge. This silent teaching was a direct spiritual influence which the mind absorbed and later interpreted according to its ability. In fact, the first European visitor has thus described it this way, Frank Humphreys. On reaching the cave, we sat before him at his feet and said nothing. We sat thus for a long time, and I felt lifted out of myself. 
For half an hour, I looked into the Maharshi's eyes, which never changed their expression of deep contemplation. I began to realize, at least somewhat, that the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. I could feel only that his body was not a man. It was the instrument of God, merely a sitting, motionless corpse from which God was radiating terrifically. My own feelings were indescribable. Another devotee from the early 1930s, Paul Brunton, who arrived more a skeptic than a believer, has given the following account of the first impact the silence of Sri Bhagavan made upon his mind. It is an ancient theory of mine that one can make and take inventory of a man's soul from his eyes. But before those of the Maharshi, I hesitate puzzled and baffled. I cannot turn my gaze away from him. My initial bewilderment, my perplexity at being totally ignored, slowly fade away as this strange fascination begins to grip me more firmly. But it is not till the second hour of the uncommon scene that I become aware of a silent, resistless change which is taking place within my mind. One by one, the questions which I prepared in the train with such meticulous accuracy drop away, for it does not now seem to matter whether they are asked or not, and it does not matter whether I solve the problems which have hitherto troubled me. I know only that a steady river of quietness seems to be flowing near me, that a great peace is penetrating the inner reaches of my being, and that my thought-tortured brain is beginning to arrive at some rest. It was not only to the restless mind of the intellectual that the grace of Bhagavan brought peace, but to the grief-stricken heart also. Echamal, as she was called at the ashram, her previous name had been Lakshmi Amal, had been a happy wife and mother in the village of Mandakolur. But before the age of 25, she lost first her husband, then her only son, then her only daughter. Stunned by her bereavement, tortured by memory, she could find no rest. She could no longer endure the place where she had been happy, the people among whom she had been happy. Thinking it might help her to forget, she traveled to Gokarnam in Bombay State to serve the holy men there. But she returned as a grief-stricken as she went. Some friends told her of a young Swami at Tiruvannamalai who brought peace to those who sought it. And so at once she set out. She had relatives in the town, but did not go to them, as the very sight of them would bring back her bitter memories. With a friend, she climbed the hill to the Swami. She stood in silence before him, not telling her grief. There was no need. The compassion shining in his eyes was healing. A whole hour she stood, no word spoken. And then she turned and went down the hillside to the town, her steps light, the burden of her sorrow lifted. Daily she visited the Swami thereafter. He was the sun that had dispersed her clouds. She could even recall her loved ones now without bitterness. She spent the rest of her life in Tiruvannamalai. She was able to take a small house there. Her father left her a little money, and her brothers helped her out, and many visiting devotees enjoyed her hospitality. She prepared food for Sri Bhagavan daily, which meant for the whole ashram, 
because Bhagavan would accept nothing that was not shared equally among all. Until age and failing health kept her away, she used to carry it up the hillside, the food, all by herself, and would never eat until she had served him. As they grew in numbers, her contribution came to be only a small addition to the general meal. But if ever she was delayed, Sri Bhagavan would wait till she came so as not to disappoint her. With all the grief she had passed through and the peace she had found, she was still mother enough to form a new attachment, and she adopted a daughter, but not without asking Sri Bhagavan's grace. When the time came, she arranged her marriage and rejoiced at the birth of a grandson, whom she named Ramana. And then one day, utterly unprepared, she received a telegram that her adopted daughter had died. The old grief broke upon her again. She rushed up the hill to Sri Bhagavan with the telegram, and he read it with tears in his eyes. Peased but still sorrowful, she left for the funeral. She returned with the child Ramana and placed him in the arms of Sri Bhagavan. Once more there were tears in his eyes as he held the child, and his compassion brought her peace. Etchamal used to practice yogic concentration into which she had been initiated by a North Indian guru. She would fix her gaze on the tip of her nose and sit in ecstatic contemplation of her light that appeared within her. Sometimes for hours together, motionless, oblivious of the body. Sri Bhagavan was told of this, but did not reply. Finally, she herself told him, and he discouraged the practice, saying, Those lights you see outside and inside yourself are not the real goal. You should aim at realizing the self, and nothing short of it. Thereupon she discontinued her former methods and placed her sole reliance in Sri Bhagavan alone.